Hello everyone and welcome to this very first lesson in this chemistry at home online course. Today we're going to talk about unit conversions between mass and moles and just overall dimensional analysis. It's going to be a very short day but we're just trying to get our feet wet with chemistry, get in the right mindset and get some fundamentals down that are really going to help us as we transition into stoichiometry next week. So the core objectives for today uh, the first three objectives are always going to be universal across all four units. So these are just the ideas of becoming equipped with the essential knowledge that you're going to need in both chemistry and health professions. Number two, and this is one we're going to talk about a lot today, which is explore UT Austin's philosophy of thinking like a chemist. And the idea here is that you want to be able to switch between the macro view which is everything we see and feel around us, and the micro view, which is the underlying explanation that takes place on that atomic or molecular scale. And lastly, and I think this is so important, and that is see the beauty and wonder in chemistry. I think that this is important just because the students who get really intrigued by the material, they become scientists. That really helps them perform well and also put it into perspective to see just why they have to take all these chemistry courses and how it plays into their future careers in medicine and research and really anything. Specifically with this lesson, our goals are going to be number one, to review the standard units of measurements from atoms to moles in experimental chemistry. That is actually going to be our focus today. And then the rest from fundamental reaction chemistry to stoichiometry, we're kind of priming ourselves today, but we're going to cover that actually next week. And so we want to keep those topics on our mind, but really we're going to get engaged with them next week. So let's jump right into it. And I'm going to begin by talking about that overall objective thinking like a chemist and the idea here, you're going to hear this statement over and over again in introductory chemistry, and it is simply the ability to transition between the micro view, which is where the chemistry happens. So it's where those atoms and molecules are vibrating, interacting, bonds are breaking, bonds are forming. And it really is the explanation for the measurements that we make, and that's the macro view. So the way I like to contrast these is if I take something like water, H2O, and I compare that to methanol. Methanol is CH3OH. So this is water. This is methanol. And I go to the, ma the macro view, this big picture view. What I'll see is I can take a beaker. This is my universal symbol for a beaker with water in it. And I'll compare it to my methanol. And one thing that I'm going to see is that they are both clear. And maybe we can put a measurement, say they're both 100 milliliters. So I'm going to write that for the water as well. Water is also clear. And I'm going to give it the same volume, 100 milliliters. So we start to do chemistry with them. We start to maybe heat them up. We start to slosh around the beakers. And we see that they do have very different physical properties. The methanol, for example, will start boiling at a much lower temperature than water. And we don't really have an explanation for that at the macro view. So we have to zoom in. And the good chemist can actually zoom into either of these beakers and see that the water has a bunch of particles that look like this. And then the methanol has a bunch of particles that look like this.
And in this course, we're going to learn how to draw pictures like this. But in all of introductory chemistry, the objective is to come up with these explanations for maybe why methanol boiled before water. And those explanations all stem from the interactions at this micro view. And so it's important to be able to draw pictures or visualize both perspectives. And you will see that come up over and over again in this course and in introductory chemistry. So what I want to do is zoom all the way in to the atomic scale. And atoms and molecules, these are what chemists consider to be fundamental units. And in order to get into all of this, I want to understand what we look at when we see each element on the periodic table. And so this is carbon. And this six, let's just break down everything here. This six is what we call Z or the atomic number and that's going to be equal to the number of protons and it's also equal to the number of electrons but I need to include that this is only if it's neutral because if you have an ion which would be a cation a positive charge or an anion negative charge you can absolutely have more or less electrons than protons. But then there's this number right here. And this number, I'm going to write it way over here, is what I would call the mass number. And that is equal to 12.0107 atomic mass units. So what makes up that mass? Well, we know that there are six protons. And each proton actually has a mass of one atomic mass unit. That's really why this unit is so helpful. And so we have six protons. And like I said, that stems from this atomic number being equal to the number of protons. But then we also need to know that the rest of the mass doesn't come from the electrons. It comes from the neutrons, which have an equal mass to the protons. So still one atomic mass unit. And so the difference between the atomic number and the mass number is the number of neutrons. So there are six neutrons, just about. And so there you have it. We have our 12 atomic mass unit mass for carbon. But let me level with you here. In the lab, we never make measurements with atomic mass unit. Instead, we scale up to the mole. And the purpose for this scaling up is so that we can get everything into units of grams because we measure everything with a gram scale. We don't have an atomic mass unit scale sitting around in every lab. It just wouldn't make sense. And so the way we scale up is we use a conversion factor. And that conversion factor is Na or Avogadro's number. And that's equal to 6.022 times 10 to to the 23rd and its unit is inverse mole which is you know a weird unit we don't have to worry about it just yet but the idea is the value of that number has a very important purpose and the value of that number allows us to go from atomic mass units and use this exact same number 12.0107, except now we have 12.0107, and our units are grams per mole. 
And that's extremely important because that means we can get the molar mass of every single item on the periodic table and we know that that is equal to grams instead of atomic mass units. So we can still use that number in the context of experimental chemistry. And that is all thanks to that sort of made up idea of the mole. And so a mole is simply a package of a bunch of molecules or atoms and how how much is a bunch well the, a bunch is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd and that is a perfect conversion between the macro world that big picture experimental measurement world and the micro world which is the tiny little fundamental universe of the atoms and molecules. So next what we're going to do is we're going to, I'm going to show you some mathematical relationships to get between all these worlds. So the worlds that we're interested in, the micro and the macro, we want to get from molecules, number of molecules or number of atoms, scale it to number of moles, and then we want to take those number of moles and maybe get molecular weight or we want to get to just the overall mass. And so these are some equations that are going to serve you well as you start working through practice problems. But here, all I want to show you is pictorially speaking, your one atom will, you just get a giant package of that. And that's what a mole is. And the same goes for molecules. So you get a giant package of molecules and that's a mole. And either of those are fundamental unit. And then a mole is just a big bunch of those fundamental units. So we're going to talk about exactly how to make those conversions here on the next slide. And so we're going to work through all these equations and show you a little example. So the first thing that you might want to do is convert from molecules to moles or vice versa. And Avogadro's number is your way to do that. So I'm going to abbreviate this and anytime you see Avogadro's number, just know that it's Na. That's the term for it. So if you see it on a constant sheet, it would be under Na. And so if I want to convert from molecules to moles, so I want you to think about this conceptually for a second. We're converting from a bunch of tiny little particles to bunches of those particles, which is what a mole is. So do you think that we would divide by the big number or multiply by the big number? So the way you do it is you take the number of molecules and you divide by Avogadro's number. And if you don't understand that, I would just really try to think about it conceptually, maybe scroll back a little bit in the video and see that picture where you're going from one tiny unit to a big bunch of units and convince yourself that that is the right direction to go. And that's going to give you the number of moles. So if I wanted to do this backwards, so from moles to molecules, I'm going from one big thing to a bunch of smaller pieces of it. So this is going to be number of moles multiplied by Avogadro's number is going to get me the number of molecules. And of course, anytime you see molecules in this case, you can interconvert it with atoms. The conversion works the same way. Molar mass is exactly what you would read on the periodic table, and its units are going to be grams per mole, and that's how we abbreviate mole. And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more in a bit, but if I wanted to go from mass to moles, I could use that molecular weight or molar mass, and that would look like mass divided by the molar mass is equal to the moles, but that doesn't really show me a lot. So I like to write it out in units. So it's grams 
multiplied by, and then I take the inverse of the molar mass, so grams per mole. And this way I show how these cancel out to equal the moles. So if this isn't quite clicking yet, what I wanna do is I wanna work through an actual example. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pick on carbon dioxide. So 2.4008, about 10 to the 24 molecules of carbon dioxide. So we have this amount of carbon dioxide and I'm also going to give you another figure and that is 176.04 grams of carbon dioxide. So this is the same system, but two different measurements. So we measured it to have 2.4 times 10 to the 24 molecules of carbon dioxide. And then we measured the mass of it and we said that it has 176.04 grams of that carbon dioxide. And what I wanna do is I wanna work through each of these conversions mathematically to get to um, just in between everything. So the first conversion I'm going to do is I'm gonna convert the molecules of carbon dioxide into moles. So if I wanna go from molecules to moles, the way I do that is divide by Avogadro's number. And so I'm going to take this 2.4 times 10 to the 24 about molecules and I'm going to divide by Avogadro's number and A, remember that's 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. And what that's going to get me actually is just four moles. And so that conversion is pretty straightforward mathematically. The challenge is dealing with all those exponents and those giant numbers on your calculator. And so you want to make sure that you are comfortable with those sorts of equations. Now, if I wanted to get to the molar mass, I have now the number of moles and I have the grams. And so all I have to do is divide those out and I'm already in the perfect units of my molar mass. And so that's gonna be equal to 176.04 grams that I measured in the lab. And then I also measured in the lab that I have four moles of that. So divide by the four moles that I have, and that's gonna be equal to 44.01 grams per mole. Now, I wanna take a step back and make sure that we understand the concept of molar mass. So we approach this through our measurements, but if we have carbon dioxide, that's CO2, there's definitely another way that we can solve for the molar mass, and that is simply to look at the periodic table. And so carbon has a molar mass of 12 grams per mole. Oxygen has a molar mass equal to 16 grams per mole, but I also have two oxygen in this formula. So I'm gonna add these together, and that's gonna be equal to 44 grams per mole. And so those numbers look pretty similar. And I did round a bit right here on this carbon. So in the end, it is the exact same value. So lastly, we can convert from mass to moles. And so I just wanna do this to prove that we did all these calculations correctly. And so I have this 176.04 grams and I have the molar mass now. So let's see if I can convert and get and prove that I have four moles here. So I'm gonna take the mass divided by the molar mass to get me the number of moles. And I'm gonna do that in this bottom way where I show all my units cancel out. So if I have 176.04 grams, and then I'm gonna divide by the molecular weight, and what that's gonna look like is I'm gonna multiply by the inverse of the molecular weight. So I'm just gonna flip that, which flips the units. So that gets me 44.01 gram, and then I put the mole on top. Notice how this is just the inverse of this right here. 
and that is going to get me four moles. As always, notice how these units cancel out. So the question here is, how do you actually learn all of this? Because it might kind of make sense when somebody walks you through it, but then you see a problem and it just doesn't look like any of this. It looks totally foreign. And that's a very common feeling to have when you first start working with all these types of conversions. And my answer to how you learn that is to simply use equations like you see up here as a crutch over and over again. And then eventually you'll see how the units cancel out and you'll be able to do everything automatically. But the answer is it truly just takes a lot of practice before things actually start coming together. But once they do, it can definitely be internalized and be looked at as pretty simple, straightforward calculations. So the last thing that I want to work on today is a couple variations of dimensional analysis because we started getting into that with these unit conversions between atoms and, and moles. But here we're going to work on just understanding the way units cancel out and how that gets us to an end goal. Here we have a common dimensional analysis problem dealing with distance and it's dealing with, well, I think I was thinking about going on vacation and just how far I would have to travel to get to paradise. But this will translate into chemistry in the sense that these skills are important throughout your entire first year of chemistry. And what I like to do is I like to say that I'm converting from miles to meters. And so I want to figure out a path to get there. And the way I want to do it for this particular problem is to just use some of the more common unit conversions. So it might not be the most straightforward method of getting from miles to meters, but it's one that if you're sitting there with a list of conversion factors, you'd be able to figure out a path based on just common conversions. And let me show you what I mean by that. I want to start with miles. 3,600 50 miles. And the goal here is I want to cancel out units until I get to meters. And you can do these as train tracks. Personally, I just write a bunch of fractions and watch how my units cancel out. And so if I have one mile, the only thing I really know is that one mile is 5,200 80 feet and that really doesn't get me too much closer to meters so I want to figure out a way that I can do that and I know that one foot is 12 inches and now I can get into the metric system because I know that one inch is equal to 2.54 centimeters and now all I have to do is convert from centimeters into meters. And I know that 100 centimeters is equal to a meter. And so now if you notice what happens, every time you have a unit on top and a unit on bottom, they're going to cancel out. So cancel out miles, cancel out feet, cancel out inches, cancel out centimeters. And what am I left with? I'm left with only the unit of meters. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna multiply all the top and then I'm gonna divide it by, well, just 100, which is the bottom. And the answer that I'm going to get, I think I have it somewhere here, is a really big number. It's going to be 5,874,000 and 105.6. So let me write that 0.6 out as well. 
0.6 meters. And this is kind of messy, so I'm actually going to report this in less sig figs. I'm just going to write 5.874 times 10 to the sixth meters. And that is our way of converting. And so you want to make sure that you know how to do dimensional analysis because it's something that is, it kind of just comes up over and over again in chemistry classes. And even though you're not going to be doing a lot of distance conversions, you're going to need to know how to use dimensional analysis to get to your desirable units. So let's put it into the context of chemistry, and this is actually going to boost the difficulty a little bit. So let's take a minute and read through this question. We have liquid toluene, which is an important industrial solvent and octane fuel booster. It has a molecular weight equal to 92.14 grams per mole and a density of 0.87 grams per milliliter. What is the volume in liters of four moles of toluene. So we're going to not only refer to our knowledge of dimensional analysis, but also refer to our ability to convert between moles and mass and then on to volume. So this is a really great example of how you're gonna see dimensional analysis in chemistry. So let's do it in the same way that we did that last problem. And I'm gonna write here that I wanna go from moles to, and I'm actually gonna write an intermediate here. I know that I can convert from moles to mass. And then I know I can convert from mass to volume. And so how do I convert from moles to mass? Well, I'm gonna use the molecular weight or the molar mass. And then how do I convert from mass to volume? Well, they give me a density and density has those units that'll help me do that. So I'm gonna write density. And that is my path. And so if you're not able to come up with that path, as long as you know dimensional analysis, you can still make the calculation and let me show you. So you have four moles. And if I'm looking through what is provided in the question, I know that my final destination is volume, but the only conversion that I have that will cancel out this moles is my molecular weight. And so I'm gonna write that here, 92.14 grams per mole. And the reason why I'm doing that is I simply wanna cancel out these units right here. And then I can move forward. If I wanted to cancel out my grams, I can use the density, and that's actually going to get me from grams into the world of volume. So that would be 0 0.87 grams per milliliter. And I could stop right there and say that I have a good volume, or I can keep going and kind of finish off this question, saying that I have 1,000 milliliters per liter, so that I can do my final cancellation. So I cancel the grams, I'm gonna cancel the milliliters, and I'm gonna end up with my units in liters. So I have to do the math here, four times 92.14 divided by 0.87 times 1,000, and that is gonna get me an answer of about 0 0.4236 liters. Now I'm not too concerned about sig figs on this particular question. If we wanted to put this into one significant figure because I'm just dealing with that four moles, it would simply be 0 0.4 liters. But what I'm focused on right now is seeing how these units cancel out, how to create a path from one unit to another. And if you can't really come up with that path on your own, then it's nice to rely on the cancellation of units to get to that final destination. And that pretty much sums up what I wanted to accomplish today with this first lesson. And now I wanna take just a quick look at next week. And I wanna focus in on Canvas. 
So if you go to the modules, you will see a list of assignments there. And basically, just like I talked about earlier on this week, there are four levels of assignments. There's the guided practice, and then there is the lesson, like what we're doing right now. Then there's the lesson quiz, followed by the optional self-practice. So for next week, you want to make sure that you get this guided practice done before or by 718, and that way you can complete the next lesson video on 718. If you want to self-pace it, if you want to break it up into multiple days, that is fine. But the important part is that you are ready to take this lesson one quiz 720. And that quiz, I like them to be low pressure, but simulating a scored assignment. So you do get three opportunities to do really well on it. And so you want to prepare with the guided practice with the lesson one. Maybe take a peek at that self-practice throughout the week if you have time, because that will be really represent as hard uh, problems as what you're going to see. So that's really great. I will leave you the link for our GChem site. What this is, is it's the UT online textbook. And so if you have any questions remaining from any particular uh, little topic here or there, this is the place that will almost 100% have the answer. Before we go, I want to just touch base one more time and say that if there are any questions or concerns as you're going through this content, please email me. My email is on the front page of Canvas. I would am very happy to help you with any sorts of questions you have. Other than that, great job on this first lesson and we will see you again next week.